Uh, hi everybody, I'm back in the UK, uh, nice and cool here, um, but I wanted to provide some uh, feedback to the uh, course that I ran last week. Uh, everybody filled in some feedback forms and actually filled in the form before the training and I asked them could they do this and could they do that, could they ask, do particular tasks and I asked them the same questions after the training. So any improvement is a measure of how successful the training was and uh, that was the reason for asking you to do it. Uh, of course the class was mixed ability, it took the whole of the engineering department so I guess there's going to be a, a range of abilities there. So I split the response um, or the data from the response into uh, an average ability group and then a high ability group which is the mean plus one standard deviation. It's all sounding very much like a fatigue assessment of test samples but okay the high ability group are the mean plus one standard deviation and low ability are the mean minus one uh, from the standard deviation and I have all the detailed response in the form of a spreadsheet um, so when I asked can they do this and can they do that they gave me different responses some people said I'm not sure how to start uh, other people said well with some help from a colleague I could do something and other more confident people would say well if I could have access to my books I could do something some felt reasonably comfortable they could tackle the problems and some uh, very confident so that's a rating uh, from 0 to 100 percent so if I take the first group first uh, which is the low ability group uh, there were some people in the class who really didn't have much idea on how to get started at the start of the uh, at the class and this is the start and this is the end. By the time they'd finished the course they'd come all the way up to feeling confident tackling the problems provided they had access to books. Uh, so I was pleased about that. The average uh, ability uh, attendees started maybe having to lean on the expertise of colleagues uh, but finished off feeling uh, reasonably confident about tackling the problems. And then the high ability attendees started out feeling reasonably confident, I guess, and maybe towards, well, we're going back to the books, I can maybe do something. But at the end of the course, even this high end uh, got themselves to a very uh, confident position. So I was pleased about that. So in fact, what we can see here is that the low ability group actually got themselves to the starting point of the high ability uh, group. But overall I, I was very pleased with the response. Uh, and there were some other good responses as well, some good tips for me on how I can improve things in the future as well and I'll be taking those on board. Um, one thing that I wasn't thought was being done particularly well was this uh, link between uh, stress level in a weld and the safety, uh, the criticality of, of the safety. So what we should try to do is identify highly stressed wells which are in a very um, uh, a very safety critical and we should focus our inspection effort there and I think if we use simple methods like dye penetrant to find surface breaking defects which always drive fatigue embedded defects are not quite so bad but I think you could balance the cost of inspection versus after sales weld repairs uh, I, I think that's something that I didn't see I didn't think I got much evidence that that was actually being done at the moment. I think it's a, a good way of uh, directing your inspection effort. Um, let's build on what we did with AWS. Uh, let's use other codes, so BS7608, Eurocode 3. There's the Welding Institute paper that Tim had, but he wasn't quite sure what to do with it. Um, and uh, in fact, if you go to the Excel Calc site, Tim, you'll find that there's a, a Eurocode 3. Uh, assessment there and those numbers that you found in this welding institute um, are in fact the very same numbers so there's a pro forma there for your calculations. Finite element methods. Personally I can't work without access to finite element methods. Uh, I understand it seems that finite element has been used as some kind of validation tool and I guess that's maybe partly because you're in Dallas and your FE team's in India. But I think you should be trying to bring that further upstream and getting some of your guys to use it. Uh, and if you need any help going through that process, uh, I'm very happy to do so. There's a, an Excel-based finite element uh, system, which is actually on the, uh, on the site now. I've directed Tim there, uh, but it's a nice beam package. In fact, it's a beautiful piece of uh, Excel coding, uh, and there's a video tutorial to go with it. But if you use just that, 
The kind of thing I saw was sizing a transverse member uh, by assuming a simple support and then sizing the end connection by assuming uh, a built-in support, which is conservative, but maybe too conservative. And using tools like this, you'll maybe find the, that your calculations become quicker and faster. So I'll just put you onto that. Uh, it could be used for things like James's problem, where we had this big stiff beam, and, and when this is clamped up uh, and the back end is fitted, then uh, we found there was a very high stress here, and we found cracks there. Uh, great. Uh, tool to use would be that Excel finite element method, uh, and that would be very good. Vibration is another thing I think we've got to think about. Uh, we've seen things particularly connected to the uh, the, the drill head. Uh, we had one particular case where we had this is the response of uh, a structure that was attached to the uh, drilling end, and um, it, 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 the hammering frequency was at 30 hertz and the response of the system was at 30 hertz so you're reading off like a, an impact factor of 5 that's accounted for the dynamic effect if you make your structure stiffer so that the the uh, hammering frequency at 30 is away from the natural frequency of the system then in fact you would be reading off much lower impact factors and that would uh, save some fatigue problems I think the next thing I want to talk about is uh, uh, details if you like. Uh, so this was something I discussed with Stephen. Uh, again it's this longitudinal member and this is a transverse member. This is actually the corner of a stiffener joining the uh, transverse member and the longitudinal member. And some of the ideas here were things like introducing a cutout to protect the end of this weld. Uh, what happens with this cutout introduced is that yes you get high stress here but stress kind of flows around the corner and by the time it comes into the stiffener, it's missed the weld end. And in fact, you get quite a lot of uh, uh, fatigue benefit from doing that. Um, let's have a look at some more. Oh, some s might be a good idea to introduce some softener details. So rather than stiffeners that were at 45 degrees, then introduce uh, things of flexible ends, if you like. It's like a stiffener with a flexible end so that the load is introduced more gradually. But to do things like this, I think it's probably something that you're going to need uh, finite element analysis uh, to do sensibly. Or you can just use it as a, a general guide. Um, you could also introduce features like a fabricated I-beam or if, or if you like a top plate that you could weld onto the I-beam. So a weld beam, uh, your I-beam currently runs underneath this piece here uh, with just a nice fatigue deal which is a, which is a, longitudinal, um, a longitudinal weld. Um, which wouldn't have a very high stress category. But then that means that your transverse member, when it's introduced, is welded here so that the I-beam, the mainframe section, stresses are running horizontally here, but your weld is isolated from that. Uh, so that's another uh, good idea. Um, I felt that operational load cases were well understood, but the tramming load cases were not. And I think maybe something we should be trying to work towards is to get together some sort of tramming load case. It might look something like this. Uh, so many G uh, in the vertical direction for so many cycles and so many G laterally for so many cycles. Probably there would be some element of twist as well. So this is a twist in the frame. Now you may have information, accelerometer information, strain gauge information that allows you to do this already. Uh, but to write down exactly what you're thinking about is always better than doing nothing uh, or allowing each engineer to make their own guess. Uh, it would just maybe tie that down a bit better. And this brings me on to uh, something called structural performance specifications. And I've been involved in writing these for Volvo and for Class uh, quite a few years ago now. But basically the documents, the documents set out the design objectives in one document. And uh, usually they're initiated by the marketing department because they want us to design products that they can sell. So it's often market driven and it's today's best estimate, really. It's, it's the best, you know, our, our best way forward, our best engineering strategy, given what we do today. Uh, and it will be validated by strain gauge tests. Uh, we would minimise the number of gauges using finite element analysis, but the spec would constantly be revised and it would be ready for the next generation of vehicles. Uh, so I've taken out some headings from some of the design specs that I've had. So initially there's a design brief, which is functionality. This is for a backhoe loader, as it happens. Uh, uh, then there's a section on structural performance, which in fact calls up a much bigger 
uh, specification. I'm going to go through that. But it thinks about maintenance. It thinks about your manufacturing velocity and how to keep cost out of your welds and materials. Uh, it thinks about uh, developing uh, and testment, so testing and planning, uh, and it thinks about the timing of all this. So that's kind of a high-level document. Then it goes into the detail of the structural performance specification itself, which would have proof load cases, all these proof load cases here, uh, fatigue load cases. You can see some uh, fatigue load cases here, uh, and the rough terrain is maybe equivalent to your tramming type load cases. Uh, then there's some safety load cases in this case because sometimes there are specific lifting applications with sp uh, specific uh, requirements, so they're separated out uh, for construction equipment. There's also some stiffness load cases. So the stiffness load case might have something to do with making sure it's away from the excitation frequency of another you know, of your uh, your hammering force or something like that. To, to get away from these vibration issues. Or in fact, this case is, is actually it's a tilt test for the backhoe loader and stiffness is required to keep the structure stable and, st and stop it turning over at low levels of load. So there's uh, different reasons for stiffness load cases. Uh, and then we also have calculation plans. So it will set out our approach, uh, our modeling approach, CAD approach, ANSYS details, uh, how we're pro processing those details, uh, how we prioritize um, those calculations and the and, and uh, test rig simulation, top level planning, detail planning, etc. Uh, etc. Et so you can see how it's worth writing all these things down. I thought it was an approach that you might want to consider yourself uh, for regarding the development of your products. Uh, then finally, the last thing I want to say is I learned all about Southern hospitality. You made me feel very, very welcome. Uh, and especially all those people who took time out of their family time uh, to, to make me, uh, make me, to just to entertain me. So, uh, of course, there will be a special thank you to uh, the delightful Mrs. Penn and also to Alex Grant from Marketing Department who went way out of his way to uh, you know, show me a good time in, in, in Dallas. So I was very pleased about that. So I had a good hard week uh, and I feel like I've earned my beer too. In fact, I've enjoyed that very same beer uh, last night uh, and uh, think my life uh, is uh, back to normal now. I'm back at home in front of my computer making silly videos that probably no one's going to listen to. But uh, uh, hopefully you'll find it instructive uh, and I, I welcome the opportunity to talking through these ideas if you like. Uh, I, you know how to get in touch with me. Uh, so thank you very much and I hope to keep in touch.